The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the final chemistry biology seminar of the semester. It's uh, our pleasure to have Dr. Cynthia Burroughs here today. She's a professor at the University of Utah, received her bachelor's degree at the University of Colorado and her PhD at Cornell, a couple of good schools. She's going to be talking to us about the chemistry of 8-oxoguanosine and DNA from cancer to the origins of life. Okay. Thank you very much, Bill. <clears throat> Thank you. This is my first visit to this part of Texas, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, we, uh, despite the fact that I personally haven't been here, we have had a long history, a pipeline of terrific students from TLU have come up to the University of Utah for graduate work. And so I, I hope that we can keep our connections uh, going and hope that uh, you will have the opportunity to visit the University of Utah in Salt Lake City uh, and the, um, the chemistry department and biological chemistry programs there. We're a um, much larger campus as a state university about 28,000 students, but of course those are spread among the undergraduate program, the medical school, the law school, engineering school, pharm school of pharmacy, and probably many other programs that I've forgotten to mention. But we think of biological chemistry, that interface between chemistry and biology, as one of our great strengths and the ability to build on the facilities at the medical school and the Huntsman Cancer Institute have really been helpful to all of our programs. So the story I'm going to tell you today is based on, um, on one molecule that is the key connection between two very different areas of research. And that connecting molecule is this one, 8-oxoguanosine in DNA. So this is an unusual base. I'm going to tell you how it plays a role, we think, in the origin of cancer, and how we also think it might play a role in the origin of life. So these are uh, very different projects. One of them funded by the National Cancer Institute of NIH, and the other funded by the National Science Foundation in, in a basic research area. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how we got interested in this particular area. I'm an organic chemist by training, but um, that was now so long ago that I, uh, I, I do remember that training, but uh, one tends to follow the research threads wherever they might lead you. One of the wonderful things for me, being in academia, is I can feel like a student for my entire life. Not that I still have final exams coming up, but that I can still move into new directions and, and learn new things. And so what I'd like to do is to tell you about some of the things I've learned along with my graduate students and, and undergraduates uh, in the last 10 or so years. <clears throat> the story starts with asking questions about what chemistry occurs when cells undergo oxidative damage. There are a couple of different sources of oxidation for the cells. Those could be um, within the cell, things like metabolism and inflammation generate free radicals that can then react with components of the cell. There are also uh, exogenous or exterior effects, UV light, ionizing radiation, uh, toxic materials that we might encounter, especially redox active transition metals. And so there are a number of different ways in which reactive species might be generated that could damage proteins or damage lipids. And in this case, I'm gonna focus on the damage that occurs to DNA. Is DNA, of course, your genetic information carrier. We're worried about damage to that molecule because it might change the genetic code when, uh, when the chemistry of a DNA component is changed. 
So what are we talking about for oxidative damage? We're especially interested in this whole class of small molecules that we call reactive oxygen species. You know that when we breathe in O2, your um, respiratory pathway takes that from O2 to superoxide to hydrogen peroxide and eventually on to water. But there are many other um, proteins that can intersect with this pathway generating um, <clears throat> species uh, including singlet oxygen, a hydroxyl radical, peroxynitrite is generated in the presence of NO, a signaling agent. Peroxynitrite can decompose in the presence of bicarbonate, which is of course you know, your, your buffer in your, in your blood and cells, and form a carbonate radical. So all of these uh, species together we call reactive oxygen species. They are short-lived and they will um, either react in a free radical mechanism or uh, do electron transfer chemistry with um, components of the cell. And so let's think a little bit about what's the outcome of oxidative da damage. In terms of DNA, we find that cells that are exposed to oxidative stress can undergo mutations, and the daughter cells uh, will especially see that changes have happened to guanine, to the G base in DNA. We see G to T transversions, G to C mutations, and also sometimes that whole nucleotide in DNA is deleted, so obviously, uh, changing all the rest of the DNA code from that point on. How does this happen? Well, we think that 8-oxoguanosine is one of the key molecules in this uh, mutagenic event. So I'll show you <clears throat> one way in which 8-oxoguanosine is formed. Um, here I've shown the uh, structure of guanine, the base uh, that we usually just call G. It's reactive at the C8 position with radicals, especially hydroxyl radical, which can be formed um, either from ra radiation, radiolysis of water generates hydroxyl radical, hydrogen atoms, or from the so-called Fenton reaction, that is hydrogen peroxide with iron or copper also generates hydroxyl radical. This can add to C8, and if you uh, then oxidize by one more electron, you end up with 8-hydroxy-G, and this is a enol form. It simply tautomerizes to the keto form. So 8-oxo-G is something that it happens very frequently in DNA, uh, more than 1,000 times per cell per day. So, in <clears throat> so every cell is constantly exposed to a certain amount of oxidative stress, and guanine being the most susceptible to oxidation, uh, this is a very frequent pathway. Uh, there's, there's a related product, uh, FAPI, that I'm not going to talk about today. So you might wonder, how does, our, how does our genome survive if we have this much damage happening per day? Well, the good news is we have a whole suite of enzymes, DNA repair enzymes, that find these damaged sites and then are able to recognize and extract out those particular nucleotides that are no longer looking like the, the, the key bases. And so, <clears throat> so we do repair these sites, but transiently, um, these materials um, are formed every day in DNA. Why is that a concern? It's a concern because 8-oxo-G can form a mispair. You would expect that guanine should base pair with cytosine via three hydrogen bonds, as shown here. But when you add the oxo group onto the uh, 8 position, it creates uh, a stereoelectronic effect where these two oxygens really don't want to be in proximity. Uh, there's also the phosphate group that I haven't shown here, 
And so there's a tendency for this base to want to rotate uh, in 180 degrees opposite. So imagine that you form 8-oxo-G with a C base pair. If those two strands come apart for replication of DNA, and you then try to build a complementary copy opposite 8-oxo-G, you might insert C opposite, or the 8-oxo-G might flip over to relieve this sort of electronic stress. If it flips over, then <coughs> in the syn conformation, it presents different groups for hydrogen bonding. And it turns out that A is a good complement for that flipped over uh, 8 oxo G. So if you incorporate A into the strand opposite, and now let's use that strand as a template, make its complement, you would put a T opposite the A. And so where you originally had a G, you make 8 oxo G and eventually have a T in its place. So the daughter cell then would have a T instead of a G. And so, um, so this is a bit of a problem. It means that under conditions of oxidative stress, you're going to see mutations, especially G to T mutations. And if that's an important part of a specific uh, codon for a, for a protein, then, uh, then you worry that that protein is not going to be functional. And because oxidative st stress is something that builds up over the course of a lifetime, uh, 8 oxo G might not be something that most of you are worried about, but there are a few of us in this room who are getting more and more worried about exposure to free radicals and how these cumulative effects of mutations are affecting our lives. And so oxidative stress and especially recurring inflammation, for example, have been implicated in any number of age-related cancers uh, because of the accumulation of mutations in key enzymes. <clears throat> okay, so I told you that, um, eight ox that G is the most easily oxidized of the four bases in DNA. It has the lowest redox potential. It's the most electron rich of the bases, so it most readily gives up an electron. Um, but if you do oxidize G to 8 oxo G, it turns out that the redox potential of 8 oxo G is even much lower, about 600 millivolts lower than guanine itself. So it now becomes a hot spot for further oxidation. And any number of radicals that we might be exposed to uh, would oxidize a number of these bases, but certainly all would be hot enough to oxidize 8 oxo G further to additional products. And so um, one of the things we wanted to figure out in our laboratory is, well, what happens if we not just oxidize 8 oxo G, but we go the next step? We oxidize one level further what happens? And here's what we figured out. We figured out that 8 oxo G first makes an intermediate that's unstable. So I won't <clears throat> talk about that until a little bit later. That adds water, and the first characterized intermediate was this one, 5 hydroxy 8 oxo G. And this is also only stable for a short while. If you look at the structure, it's um, it looks a little like a hemiaminal, an intermediate, right, in either imine or carbonyl formation, depending on which way you're going. And this can rearrange to a more stable species by um, deprotonation and a 1 2 carbonyl shift. If you do that shift, you end up making this spirocyclic dihydantoin. This is an unusual structure, but once you've made that, it's actually very stable. The, uh, the R group here is the ribose and the connection to the rest of the DNA backbone. Is, but this, of course, is a, an interesting looking spirocyclic molecule, but it doesn't really look anything like guanine, right? It's a pretty different structure. The other structure that's made, actually preferentially, we make the spirocycle, if we just work with a monomer or single-stranded DNA, if 
we have double-stranded DNA, then the bases are all stacked up in this ladder formation, and each base being stacked on top of each other, there's not really room for this heterocycle to form this twisted base. So we find that a different reaction mechanism competes. We add water at the carbonyl, uh, ring open, and then lose CO2, and we generate this hydantuin, uh, guanidino hydantuin structure. So these two products that we can identify by mass, this is uh, 10 compared to 8 oxo-G, minus 10 compared to 8 oxo-G, this is plus 16 compared to 8 oxo-G. So we can uh, we identify these by mass, we can see when they occur in DNA, and to some extent where they occur. Uh, <clears throat> but these, this was a, uh, a set of reactions that took us quite a long time to sort out. As I know, I know most of you have done NMR experiments. You have an NMR here. If you take, for example, this spirodihydantuin and go run an NM, a proton NMR spectrum, what are you going to learn? There's not much to look at. <laughs> And so proton NMR was useless to us. Um, <clears throat> carbon NMR was slightly useful, but there's mostly a lot of carbon eels and CN bonds. And so we had to decipher this by putting isotopes in various places, fragmenting by mass spectrometry, and independent synthesis. So it actually took us years to really sort out the structures of these small molecules. Okay. Anyway, we now know that they form. They form differentially in double-stranded DNA compared to single-stranded DNA. But we're also interested in their properties. And I'm going to now summarize about 10 years of biochemistry on one slide. <laughs> and I'm sorry, there were six different PhD students who worked on different aspects of this work. And I'm not giving full, uh, full credit to all of their work but it's now published, and so I'll, I'll, I'm going to go on to a, a different story. Let me just tell you that we found that when these are present in DNA, they are 99% miscoding. What does that mean? That means that if you're trying to build a complementary strand of DNA and you encounter GH or SP, you don't put in a C opposite the normal complement. You put in an A or a G, so you always make a mistake. And that means that you end up with mutations, either G to T or G to C. Uh, although there's some good news, there's a repair enzyme in humans, it's called NEAL, human NEAL-1. And the uh, NEAL enzymes recognize these hydantoins, take them out of DNA, and allow normal synthesis then to fill in the gap. And so, so this is kind of a bad news, good news story. Okay, <clears throat> so those are the biological um, consequences of this further oxidation of 8-oxo-G. But there were other things that we wondered about with, with 8-oxo-G, and we were always fascinated by the fact that it is so redox active. Its redox potential is so much lower than that of G. And I have to tell you that, in fact, one of the things that stimulated the other part of the story I'm going to tell you about is that for many years, I would go home at Thanksgiving or Christmas, and my mom would say, what is it you do again? <laughs> and I would tell her about, you know, I study DNA damage and free radicals and mutation and cancer and all these things. And she says, you're always talking about damage. Don't, don't you do anything constructive? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, unfortunately, some of us study bad news. You know, we want to understand the molecular origin of disease. But I think those questions triggered in my mind a, a, a question, do we always have to look at 8-oxo-G uh, as damage? Is there some way in which this re great reduction in redox potential could be advantageous to an organism. When would you ever want to have 
a redox active DNA or RNA base. When, when would that be? And so that stayed in the back of my mind and we began to contemplate other aspects of nucleic acid chemistry. So this is a picture in Utah and it's not snow. Has anybody been there? Bonneville Salt Flats, you've been out there? Well, when I go out to the salt flats, you, know, you look around, and if my father-in-law were not in this picture, okay, then I'll take him away. Okay, so without my, <laughs> without my father-in-law there, it doesn't look like there's any life out there at all, right? It's a harsh environment. So this is what I want you to think about. Imagine going back four billion years ago, and what did we have on this planet? You know, we've got whatever the geochemistry is that we were given on Earth. We have some kind of atmosphere. We don't know exactly what that atmosphere was back then. It could have been reducing. It could have been methane. It's not really clear. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure if we had fire, but we certainly had some amount of sunlight, especially UV light. We didn't yet have an ozone layer, presumably. And, um, and water, um, I think this was always, there's always been a lot of water around on our planet. And so how do we go from some fairly simple elements in a uh, fairly harsh environment, how did the right elements come together to create the molecules of life, to create cells as we know them now? And those are the questions that we started thinking about. And here, a lot of people think about these questions. And so there is a kind of um, flow chart that people think about in terms of origin of life studies. And while I've shown a picture of Utah, a part of planet Earth, this is most interesting at this point to, as, as NASA and sci scientists continue to find other planets, we wonder when we get to those other planets, or when we can send probes to those planets, what are we going to be looking for to identify life on another planet? It's unlikely that it's going to be, you know, Spock or, you know, somebody who stands on two legs and shakes hands or, or you know, speaks any kind of a language. It's most likely to be a microorganism. But will we recognize it? Will we recognize it as life? And so we'd like to know um, what molecules go together to make the original biomolecules of a cell or of an organism. We think now that RNA played a very key role in generating life, because there was a time, presumably, when RNA was both the genetic code of the organism and the um, and the catalyst for reactions. Ribozymes and riboswitches now have been shown to do many of the functions of protein-based enzymes. So possibly in the RNA world, RNA basically did it all. At some point, we also had proteins. This is called the ribonucleoprotein world. And at, at this point, there was a transition where proteins got better at catalyzing reactions than RNA. And um, then there was presumably something that was the precursor to the three kingdoms of life that we have now. This uh, precursor is called LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. And we don't know too much about it, whether it was already having DNA, if it had still U, or if it had T in it, did have the capability to put the methyl group onto T. Uh, <clears throat> had ribonucleotide reductase that converts the uh, RNA into DNA uh, nucleotides. Had that evolved at this point? And so there are all these different questions about what you would need in your primordial soup to start on a pathway toward uh, the molecules of life. The, um, uh, some people believe that the primitive metabolism was based on the redox chemistry of, 
iron and sulfur and potentially zinc. And if life originated in deep sea vents then, that were very mineral rich, that is um, a very uh, intriguing possibility. But at some point, we change to a system where we use organic redox cofactors. So our metaboli metabolism, it does use iron and copper and zinc to a certain extent, but, um, but we also use NADH and FADH2, right? We use flavins and nicotinamides to do um, our present day uh, metabolism. And if you think about these little molecules, these are little bits of RNA with modified bases. And so let me show you some of those ba bases. Um, this is a pterin. It looks a lot like guanosine. It has an expanded ring here. Instead of a five-membered ring, it's got a six-membered ring. Here's flavin adenine dinucleotide. So here's the adenosine group. And here's the flavin, part of a ribose and phosphate. The flavin part, again, looks a little bit like guanosine, but it doesn't have the NH2 as an oxygen, and there's a benzene ring added on the left side. And then nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is also adenosine and now another um, nucleotide added. But these unusual bases, terin, uh, flavin, and nicotinamide all have redox capability. And so what we are going to propose is that potentially before these more elaborate, more highly evolved nucleotide cofactors came around, could adoxoguanosine have been a redox active cofactor back in the RNA world? So let, let's think about this a little more. Um, I'm going to show you that there are some similarities in chemistry between flavins and terins and 8 oxo -G. There's chemistry at this position. It's called 4A in a flavin or 5 in a terin. And I already showed you the spirocyclic rearrangements and some of the uh, chemistry that happens at this position in 8 oxo -G. And I told you already that uh, guanosine, of course, would be a good starting point for making a redox active base, it has the lowest redox potential. It's already the most redox active. And when we oxidize it to 8 oxo -G with any of these pretty ordinary looking radicals, we get a molecule that has dropped 600 millivolts in redox potential. And that's actually halfway to where we need to go. So if you look at a table of redox potentials, guanosine is too high to be useful, it's too hard to oxidize in a catalytic cycle of an enzyme, but flavin is way down here, terin's not too far off of that. 8 oxo -G is about halfway to where we need to go for a highly evolved redox active nucleotide coenzyme. And it's derived in one step from guanosine, just oxidation. We've also looked at a number of other related species, and, um, and basically those don't get you as far, and so far they're not very uh, catalytically active for us. But so our proposal then is that the most efficient way back in the RNA world, if once you had the four bases picked out, the most efficient way to convert one of those to a redox active catalyst would be to oxidize G to 8 oxo G in one step. So our next task was to say, could we do an experiment that shows 8 oxo G could be as um, competent as a flavin, for example, in catalyzing a redox reaction? And so, um, I'm not going to skip this right now, but just to show you that it's this intermediate 8 oxo G ox that looks very much like the oxidized flavin. Okay? So this was our thought process, is that this chemistry looks very much like flavin chemistry. And so, and, and 8 oxo G, we believe, was available in the RNA world. 
This does have a laser pointer in it, and it's probably better than the one I've got, except it's not turned on. Is there an on or off switch? Oh, yes. On the side. Hang on. My batteries are dying, so. On. Here we go. That's better, right? Can you see that better? Okay. <clears throat> we think that 8 oxo G was available because all you need is photolysis of water, and you could generate 8 oxo G. Okay, so here's the reaction we're going to look at. And, um, and this might not originally seem related, but it is, okay? When UV light uh, hits DNA, especially in your skin, uh, you dimerize two adjacent thymines to make a thymine dimer. And so uh, when the two T's are adjacent and only connected through the the phosphate backbone, I'm just going to call that a TT. When this 2 plus 2 reaction occurs, you give a cyclobutane. I'm going to indicate that with this little um, bracket, the thymine dimer. Thymine dimers are um, something that are very much of interest because they distort the structure of DNA, cause mutations, and are implicated in skin cancer. And, and so these types of, this type of chemistry happens with fairly high frequency in your skin cells. Also happens in plants, of course. Plants are constantly exposed to, to sunlight. Sorry, wrong one. <clears throat> and so the good news is there's an enzyme in plants and bacteria called photolyase. And what it does is to absorb longer wavelength light and use that light and to, um, to convert a flavin to its excited state, which then transfers an electron to the thymine dimer. The thymine dimer, once it has an extra electron, it's added an electron to an antibonding orbital that splits apart within a few picoseconds the, uh, the cyclobutane the electron gets transferred back to the radical, making ground state flavin again, and your other product is the normal two thymines in a row. So in this reaction, uh, the, flav the role of the flavin is to uh, absorb light, transfer an electron, get the electron back. So it's catalytic, and it's triggered by absorption of a photon. So we asked the question then, could 8 oxo G do this in, instead of the flavin? Okay, here's uh, why we think this might work. We can put 8 oxo G in the same duplex structure as a thymine dimer. We can shine light on 8 oxo G. And if we look at the absorption spectrum of 8 oxo G, it has this long wavelength. Uh, absorption band in the UV, it actually tails out above 300 nanometers. I don't know if you can see this from the back, but this blue line shows you where 300 nanometers is. So we're going to try to put long wavelength light into 8 oxo G. That's a region of the spectrum where DNA does not absorb, but where the sun does emit, okay? So we'll try to get light into the 8 oxo G, not into the other bases, and then transfer an electron. Okay, how do we do the experiment? We make a short piece of DNA, and in our DNA we made an 18 mer shown on the top that contains a thymine dimer right about in the middle. To do this, we just made a sequence with two T's in a row. We had to be careful that there is no other place where there are two T's or two C's or a C and a T together, because then you would make CC dimers and CT dimers, and you, you would make a mess, basically. So we engineered this to just have one thymine dimer in it. Then we can also synthesize DNA that has 8 oxo G in a specific location, and we put it nearby the thymine dimer. You'll also notice that the top strand is shorter than the bottom strand, 
and that is so we can separate the two by HPLC. And so here's what the HPLC trace looks like. Uh, look at the bottom graph in blue. The 18 mer that contains the thymine dimer comes out first, and the 22 mer comes out last, about 10 minutes later or more. And if we shine light on this, a new uh, peak appears. That's the repaired strand. So the, the cyclobutane is no longer there. It's just a plain 18 mer, and we can watch that peak grow in as a function of time. So this was the very first experiment we did. I was delighted that it worked. We then sort of perfected the system. We worked more on um, getting more light into it, and we've been able to shorten the time down to a couple of hours. We used to do 10-hour photolyses, now we do two hours. And we have a, a more efficient process. Now the HPLC trace is not too pretty, uh, very broad peaks here, but that's partly because we run the whole thing at 70 degrees. So 70 degrees is pretty hot. We're getting a lot of diffusive spreading of our LC peaks. But nevertheless, it's enough so that we can uh, quantify these peaks and compare them and follow the reaction, uh, reaction rate. So this reaction follows simple first order kinetics and we can uh, determine a, a rate constant for that reaction. That was the one in which adoxo G is in the opposite strand but it's close by the five prime side of the TT dimer, okay? Now the other curious thing here that you'll notice is we put in 8-oxo-G not with its normal partner C opposite, but with A opposite. Why did we do that? Why did we put A in there? Anybody remember why I said? Sorry, what? It does base pair with A, so that's good. It base pairs both with C and with A. The problem is if we had put a C there, when we tried to photochemically generate our TT dimer, we would have had a mixture of CT and TT dimers. So, so we didn't initially think we could do that study. But the, the, uh, the good, uh, I will show you that we've since done that. Um, uh, but, and since the first experiment worked, I decided, okay, now we'll go buy the reagent for solid phase synthesis of DNA. Uh, and, and that costs about $2,000 per micromole. So you see why I didn't want to do that straight off the bat. But since the reaction worked and the NSF grant got funded, I said, okay, we'll spend $2,000 and we'll go buy that reagent. And so we have since put C in that position, just as you would expect. Okay, but the, the f next experiment we did was to put the oxo-G on the three prime side of the thymine dimer, and it didn't work as well. And we also tried moving it out further away, and then it really didn't work at all in this case. And so it's very distance dependent, and has a preference for what side it's on. So we thought that was interesting. We also, <clears throat> uh, this is that first trace again, we also put in a mismatched pair. So oxo-G doesn't pair with G very well. So that's not a good base pair. We have a floppy helix there. And that doesn't work so well. And if we don't have oxo-G present at all, so we have a GT base pair there, then there's no reaction. So here's a reaction that's dependent on 8 oxo-G and the 8 oxo G has to be close because it's not that great a catalyst. It's not a flavin, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, but the questions, of course, that came up, why don't we put in the oxo G C base pair instead of uh, A or G? And couldn't we put the oxo G in the same strand? Well, we, we could if we buy the expensive reagents and make it through solid phase synthesis. So I'll show you some of those data next, okay? As I, I told you before, 8-oxo-GA is a perfectly good base pair, as is 8-oxo-GC, but when we put the C in instead of the A, actually it was threefold worse. So I'm glad we didn't start 
<laughs> glad we didn't start here. I might have been discouraged and not even continued on the project. We had a, a better result here when the A is opposite. I'll address that again in a minute. And then, if we put the OxoG in the same strand as the thymine dimer, now all of a sudden it works great. Still, however, the preference to be on the five prime side rather than the three prime side um, of the uh, eight OxoG, and uh, a preference to be in the same strand um, and, and to have A opposite rather than C opposite. And so we're homing in on what characteristics of the DNA duplex are best for having this kind of electron transfer repair. <coughs> okay, so what do we propose as a mechanism? Uh, we think that when we have OxoG somewhere nearby and we irradiate with uh, 310 nanometer light, the light's absorbed by the OxoG, so we get a, an excited state of OxoG, that does electron transfer, an electron hops from OxoG to thymine dimer, so that gives us a transient radical cation, radical anion pair. Then we have fast cleavage of the cyclobutane, and then back electron transfer, so now we have the repaired strand. So what has this done? OxoG has just been a photocatalyst to move an electron over until those bonds break and move it back. And the OxoG actually has not changed in this reaction, right? In fact, um, you know, we could also consider other mechanisms of, uh, and, and we've done that, but I think I won't go into that today. Uh, I think I'm also going to skip this particular uh, part of the story. We were interested in whether or not OxoG really acts catalytically to go here and back, or, you know, to just um, donate an electron, or does it go all the way to these permanently oxidized products that I had told you about before? So we studied these by um, looking more carefully at the HPLC. Uh, in the middle is the trace of a strand containing 8-OxoG. Then we use that to do about 50% repair of a thymine dimer, and then we look at the, the OxoG strand again. It has not changed. If it had been oxidized to SP or GH, we would get new peaks, and there's not much there. I don't, I don't think that's happened. That's pretty clean. So it looks like OxoG is necessary, but it doesn't get used up or converted in this reaction. That's good. We could also use it to do actual turnover in the catalysis. Here's how we did that. We took a, a four or five fold excess of strands containing thymine dimer and only one complementary strand uh, to, uh, of, of 8-OxoG. We irradiate for a while to repair some of these strands then we heat up to 85 degrees. At 85 degrees, the, the strands come apart. You break all the hydrogen bonds. Then you cool it back down, and a new strand can come in and re-anneal. Then what we have is um, a new substrate. We have OxoG now bound to a thymine dimer strand, so you can irradiate again. And we just cycled this several times, and we were able to see um, after five cycles, instead of only getting a 20% yield of product, we got a 40%. We got twice as much yield as we expected, and so it's clear that the OxoG can turn over in this reaction. So OxoG is showing all the primitive characteristics of, a, um, of, a, of an enzyme, really. It's being catalytic. It's not uh, it's specific in the type of reaction. It needs to be close by and pr in proximity to do a reaction, and it, it shows turnover. Uh, and so we studied this in um, quite a lot more detail, and I, th I think in view of the hour, I'm not going to go into all the different studies that we did and how we studied the long-range effects, but I'd like to just uh, tell you a little bit more about the structure and how we think this is happening. 
here's a, um, a crystal structure of a thymine dimer. And the crystal structure that was done, not by us, it's reported in the literature, uh, there was an, an A base here. And so I want you to just imagine that this is an oxo-G base. And if you look at the positioning of that oxo-G, this is our best case scenario, it's immediately on the phi prime side, then that is stacked very nicely on top of the thymine, uh, thymine dimer. And if we look at this um, uh, from the top down, you see that where our oxo-G would be, where this A is, uh, it's stacked very well on the thymine dimer, but the base on the three prime side isn't on top of the thymine dimer. So this explains why there's a very special location where we get the most efficient electron transfer. It works best if the two pi stacks or, or two rings are stacked right on top of each other so you can transfer an electron from one pi system to the other. <clears throat> and I think that's more or less what that says, is the stacking preference is directional. And uh, we also found that oxo-G, if it was opposite the T, could work nearly as well as being adjacent the T. So this is telling us more and more about how we might bring oxo-G into proximity to do this reaction. Okay, finally, I just want to show you one or two slides about the, uh, about the whole concept of the RNA world. Everything I told you about so far was done in DNA, and that's partly because DNA is a lot easier to work with than RNA. DNA doesn't hydrolyze so rapidly. It's cheaper to synthesize, and also we have more experience with it in my lab. So we did all of our initial studies in DNA, but we don't think there was DNA in the RNA world. So the question is, could any of this work in RNA? So we had to then synthesize the uracil dimers instead of thymine dimers, we meant uracil dimers, and look to see whether or not we could repair those in RNA. And so we can make uh, UU dimers photochemically in a strand and then put it together. I think I won't go through the HPLC trace. And we could do this reaction with a UU dimer in RNA and 8 oxo-G in DNA or by putting both of them in RNA. So in one case, we've got an RNA-DNA hybrid. Here we've got an RNA-RNA duplex. And the, the bottom line is it doesn't work as well in RNA. It's not as efficient, but the good news is it does work, okay? We get a lower yield after two and a half hours, but it still works. And so we're, we're very interested in now continuing to see, can we work with small RNAs, the kinds of early RNAs that might have been present in the RNA world? Can we see whether or not this photochemical reaction might have helped preserve an RNA genome by reversing that formation of a, of a UU dimer, which would be detrimental to that early genome going forward. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so we've learned a lot about both DNA and RNA. Here's hopefully what I've told you. 8-oxo-G can catalyze this photo reversal with turnover it has some preferences about location, and we think we're learning a lot about the mechanism. There's actually quite a lot more physical chemistry we need to do because one of the questions here really rests on the photophysics of the excited states of these uh, bases. And how long-lived are they, um, and, and what are their properties? So we hope we can collaborate with a femto uh, second spectroscopist and really uh, nail that down. I knew Bill would be excited if I talked about spectroscopy here, so I wanted to put that in. Okay, so that's much of what we've learned, and, and overall, we think it is possible that 8-oxo-G, or perhaps its partner, um, a related molecule, the uric acid, uh, could have been a primitive flavin, because after all, these molecules uh, portray that similar chemistry that you see uh, in flavins and in terrans. And so um, 
we, we would like to explore other bases, uh, but we've been excited by this, this first result telling us that what we always viewed initially as DNA damage, okay, a bad thing to happen in DNA, that our viewpoint here was from that of a human on Earth in the 21st century because that kind of damage can lead to cancer. But on the other hand, if you're on a primitive planet trying to evolve life, maybe these changes in the RNA bases or could actually be advantageous. So instead of being a damage, it's an advantage. So, uh, so anyway, that is our concept of how uh, the RNA world might have evolved a primitive metabolism. Uh, and, and what we think is, is a very unusual example where one kind of DNA damage is actually being used to repair another, which is really uh, food for thought. Uh, so finally, um, I'd like to just take one minute. Oh, I need to, of course, thank my research laboratory. Almost all the work I told you about in the second half was done by uh, Kim Nguyen, and he's shown right here, assisted by a number of other people, uh, Jim Muller, Nicole Rosencrantz, uh, Aaron Fleming, and others in the lab to, um, <coughs> to carry out this chemistry. Uh, and we were funded by NSF on this particular project. But before I leave, also to tell you that there are many other people and places in Utah that where you can do um, great research like this. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to the state of Utah, you will want to make sure you get there, uh, not just to Salt Lake City, but to some of our national parks. Um, you probably know that Salt Lake City was a host to the 2002 Olympic Games, Winter Olympic Games. This is Alta nearby. Uh, there are some other areas in southern Utah, uh, uh, Bryce Canyon, Arches Park. These are about four hours away from Salt Lake City. And so even if you don't come to Salt Lake, you have to go to the national parks in southern Utah. They're really fabulous. <clears throat> we have a number of different um, chemistry options within our department, including analytical chemistry, uh, especially a focus on bioanalytical chemistry. Uh, as I told you, we have biological chemistry and chemical biology, depending on how you um, define those. We have several new young assistant professors. I've highlighted some of their work here who are uh, involved in chemistry of nucleic acids, proteins, uh, and uh, medicinal chemistry, uh, drug design physical chemists in our department work on catalysis, alternative energy, uh, nanomaterials, and spectroscopy. There's a whole lot of words there. I can, I can leave you a copy of these slides to look at in, in your spare time. Uh, inorganic chemists and organometallic chemists of different flavors. And then um, in organic chemistry, I wanted to highlight two things. Uh, Gary Keck's lab has gotten a lot of press recently for their very nice synthesis of bryostatin, a, a very interesting biologically active molecule that I hope will not only cure cancer but Alzheimer's, which is just showing more progress for Alzheimer's, in fact. Uh, and then um, I also need to mention the work of my colleague Peter Stang. Um, these, uh, this is one of those interesting squares that we had just talked about. Uh, Peter just came back from the White House where he received from President Obama the National Medal of Science. And so that was uh, nearly a month ago. And so uh, we're very proud of his accomplishments as well. So there are many options for uh, conducting chemistry. This is an artist's conception of our new chemistry building. Um, right now it's a big muddy hole in the ground. Uh, the foundation is going in this week, but uh, we hope that it will be open uh, in another uh, less than two years. And I, it looks like my battery is out of life here, so I'm going to call it quits at that point. Thank you so much for being here. And for this
Dr. Gorski? Yes. Um, you mentioned previously in your presentation about the fall flat and kind of to the heart of the organism and the biochemistry that was in the heart condition in the primordial soup of life. Has there been any evidence of this biochemistry of eight oxid lungs being existing in the heart of the organism that do live in the heart condition? Yeah, it's certainly found, uh, eight oxo G is found in all organisms. The place where I would really like to see it, and I have not seen a report of it, uh, there have been reports of, of the DNA, several of the DNA bases, adenine and guanine and xanthine, which is a related nucleoside, but these have been found in meteorites, okay, suggesting that there are, you know, extra extrasolar sources of the DNA bases, that these things can form by condensation of, um, of formamid and ammonia and CO2 or whatever combination of chemistry to make uh, the heterocyclic bases. So that's very encouraging. That tells you that these are, you know, very fundamental building blocks. Of course, nobody's seen extraterrestrial biopolymers, and they haven't found ribose <laughs> connected to a base and things like this. But those are the sorts of experiments one would like to do. The connection to Bonneville salt flats, I, I didn't entirely explain in part due to time, but uh, so, so there are, there's the thought that life could have originated in deep ocean vents, right, because they're very mineral rich, warm, and a uh, lot of elements there. There's another thought that it could have originated in actually deep cracks, fissures in rocks. But then there are also ideas that salt flats could have played and ice could have played major roles. One of the problems you have in trying to get these small molecules to condense together to form the heterocyclic bases is that, you know, things are kind of spread apart and the ocean is very dilute. You know, how do you get these materials together to react? One way you can do that is by high salt conditions, then you concentrate things in an aqueous pocket in, uh, in a salt, uh, so in a brine solution. DNA, for example, or, and RNA as well, is tighter uh, hydrogen bonding in a high salt solution because you basically you know, salt together the hydrophobic molecules. Um, and also, the, if, if this occurred in, um, uh, in a desert environment, you could use UV light to do additional chemistry on these materials. And so, so I don't know, my personal uh, thoughts run to salty deserts <laughs> for the origin of life, but I don't know, unless you invent a time machine for us, we'll never be able to go back and really know what happened. We can just try to reinvent it, right? Yes. Sorry, I can't hear very well. Yeah. Uh, for the intermediate radical anion and Correct. yes, yes. well, me personally, no, but this is a very, very active area of research. And there are quite a few physical chemists actually <laughs> studying uh, these reactions, and so there have been measurements made on the actual enzyme photolyase and how it conducts the reaction and how long lived the radical anion is and how that splits apart. There's been a lot of theoretical investigation to calculate which bond breaks first. And they think that they break not simultaneously, but both very rapidly. Uh, so there, there are many, there's probably about 400 papers out there on this whole mechanism for photolyase. For our version, the 8-oxo-G, uh, none of those details have been studied or computed. We just know the final product.
start here, end up there, and there's a black box in the middle. That, you know, we'll try to, that's mechanism, right? That's, we'll try to get there. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Sorry, there was uh, three traces of resistance um, where you had a truck component that had several other seats. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite catch what was going on in that, that, that slide. <sighs> three traces. Can you show the middle, middle trace and then the after the fact where there was no stains on the upper line? And then on the top, there was a, another trace with several seats on it? Yeah, that, that if, if we had simply... If we just take a strand containing 8-oxo-G and we expose it to light and oxidants, then we get irreversible oxidation to these hydantoin products, GH and SP. And we know what those look like in the HPLC. They give these, you know, this complicated set of peaks. Each of those products is two diastereomers, so we get doubled peaks every time we do this. So we knew what we were looking for. But when we do this reaction for thymine dimer repair, we don't get any of those peaks. Very clean. So that tells us that while the 8 oxo G is necessary for the repair, it's not undergoing an irreversible re oxidation reaction. So it must be both transferring the electron to initiate the repair and accepting it back. So yeah, it was amazingly clean. Frankly, I'm surprised this works so well. Most of my ideas don't work that well. <laughs> but this one worked okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank Other questions? <laughs> Students at TLU engage in high impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.